It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Uh, good morning, Speaker, and my question is to the Premier. For weeks, uh, this side of the House has been trying to get answers from the Conservative government on their Greenbelt uh, corruption scandal, and they've responded by voting down motions and standing in the way of accountability. They're now under active criminal investigation by the RCMP. Yesterday, I, asked, I again urged the Premier to ask the Integrity Commissioner to get to the bottom of the boys' trip his senior staff and former Conservative minister took to Las Vegas. I'll ask the Premier again. Will the Premier ask the Integrity Commissioner to investigate the 2020 trip to Vegas? And to reply, the Government House Leader and Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Just, uh, that the Integrity Commissioner will uh, do whatever work he needs to do. Uh, uh, at the same time, Mr. Speaker, it's no doubt uh, it's pretty understandable why the Leader of the Opposition is looking backwards, because she doesn't want to look forward, because when she does look forward, she'll see what is happening in the province of Ontario. It's actually fitting that we have a delegation here from York Region, because in York Region, we're building schools where they closed them. We're building roads where they couldn't. We're building transit and transportation, including the subway that the Liberals failed on for 15 long years. Our economy is booming in the area. Our farmers are doing better because of the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, Mr. Speaker. They want to look backwards. We'll look forwards. But really, Mr. Order. Speaker, the entire party's premise for being is about looking backwards. It's never about looking forwards. They're a backward party, Mr. Speaker. And that is why the people of the province of Ontario look to progressive conservatives to move the economy forward each and every time. Order. Order. Member for Ottawa South will come to order. The Minister of Energy will come to order. Perhaps the member for Ottawa South didn't hear me. He will come to order. The Minister of Energy will come to order. The clock. Supplementary question. <clears throat> well, Speaker, the Premier won't do it, but we will. That's why this morning we tabled a complaint to ask the Integrity Commissioner to offer an opinion on the Vegas trip. The people of Ontario have questions about why two of the Premier's staff members and a former Cabinet Minister all seemingly lied under oath to the Integrity Commissioner about the dates of the trip. The former Minister, and two members of the Premier's most senior advisers, all suspicious. I would ask the Leader of the Opposition to withdraw the unparliamentary comment. Wrong. The former Minister and two members of the Premier's most senior advisers all told the Integrity Commissioner that their trip was in 2019 when it actually occurred months later. That's three different people giving the wrong date for the same trip. So my question, again, to the Premier is, can the Premier explain how three different people could mistakenly give the wrong date for the same trip? Mr. Minister of and Housing. We'll let the Integrity Commissioner do uh, his work. I'm uh, uh, sure that he uh, will do that in an effective, uh, effective uh, way. But let's uh, again talk about what we're seeing across the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. I talked about yesterday that things are challenging. Things can be challenging when you have policies like the Liberals and the NDP, right? We're seeing these policies in Ottawa, a carbon tax which is costing the people of the province Order. of Ontario on literally every single thing that they do. They hold the balance of power in Ottawa. Will they ask the federal NDP to do something about the carbon tax? No, Mr. Speaker. It is the same policies that brought the province of Ontario to its knees under the Liberal and NDP coalition. It's fitting that we have York Region here again, because since we've been in office, Mr. Speaker, 27,000 more jobs in York Region, Mr. Speaker. 4,500 companies in York Region. It is the second largest tech hub in Canada, Mr. Speaker, because of the leadership of this Premier and this Minister, Mr. Speaker. And tomorrow, the Minister of Long-Term Care Friday will be there to open up another Thank you. Member will take a seat. The final supplementary. 
Speaker, I understand why they don't want to answer the questions because they're under criminal investigation by the RCMP. <laughs> this, this House knows that the discrepancies don't end there because those members also misled the integrity commissioner about interactions. I have to ask the member to withdraw her unparliamentary comment and finish her question. The, uh, the former minister, the premier senior advisors, told the integrity commissioner different things about interactions they had with Greenbelt speculator Shakira Matula while on these trips. The former minister said he and the premier's staff only saw the Greenbelt speculator Question. in the lobby of the hotel. Now we know that they got spa services, including concurrent massages, at the same hotel at the same time. So I'm going to go back to the premier speaker. Does the premier agree that it's a general rule that members of provincial parliament should provide honest testimony to the integrity commissioner? Members, of please take their seat. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing can respond. Security Commissioner uh, do his work, but I think this is really about the leader of the opposition, isn't it? Because we're debating a motion today in front of this house to censure a motion of the uh, to censure a member of that party, Mr. Speaker. Why? Order. Because of, of, of Order. actions that are disreputable to a member Order. that have brought this house into disrepute. Now, curiously, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition told the member to retract and apologize. The member refused to do that, and now we're seeing that the NDP Order. caucus is in a full-blown revolt against their own leader, refusing to follow the edict of the leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker. When it comes Order. to leadership, we'll take the leadership of this premier, who has brought 700,000 jobs to Ontario, that has removed taxes, that has taken the lowest income earners off the tax rolls, Mr. Speaker. The economy is booming, despite the policies of the Liberals and NDP to hold people back. We'll continue to get the job done. Order. Order. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. This is disgusting. Disgusting behaviour by this member. It shouldn't be that hard. It should not be that hard. Order. There are no points of order considered during question period. The Minister of Education will come to order. The Minister of Education will come to order. The member for Kitchener Conestoga will come to order. Order. Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. The Minister of Education perhaps didn't hear me either. He must come to order. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition has the floor. It shouldn't be that hard, Speaker. Members should always be telling the truth, especially to the Integrity Commissioner. Speaker, back to the Premier. A Greenbelt speculator went on a trip to Vegas at the same time at the same hotel Order. as a senior members, senior members of the Premier's staff and a cabinet minister. And what's worse is that no one can recall the particulars of just how they paid for that trip. The Premier's former minister paid $4,550 in cash for three flights to Vegas. Rooms at the Wynn Las Vegas apparently go for more than $700, $700 a night speaker. Yet the cabinet minister says he was paid paid back $2,000 total in cash from the Premier's staff. That doesn't even cover the cost of the flight, Speaker. Why or who does the Premier think paid for the trip to Vegas? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. We'll let the Integrity Commissioner do, uh, do his job, but if the Leader of the Opposition wants to talk about accountability, maybe she'll rise in her place and repeat what she said when yes. the microphone was turned off, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, because yeah. in this place, 
We are debating this morning a motion about the dignity of this House, the dignity that all members owe to this House and to this Parliament, Mr. Speaker. That's what the motion this morning is about. The Leader of the Opposition, by her comments when the mic is turned off, proves that she's never going to be ready to be the Premier of the Province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. It is this Premier who shows leadership each and every day on the economy, standing up for people, Mr. Speaker. It is this Premier and this caucus will get the job done, and when they sit down and sit on their hands, We'll stand up for all of the people of the province of Ontario. You have our word on that. We'll continue to do it. Order. Order. The supplementary question. Speaker, I, I don't, I mean, the former cabinet minister. Order. The former cabinet minister showed the integrity commissioner banking receipts for a deposit of $2,000 on December 20th, 2019. That's before the trip, and that's before any of the Premier's staff had apparently repaid him. It doesn't even match what the Premier's senior advisers said they paid back. In fact, the Premier's former Principal Secretary, Mr. Masudi, said he provided cash to the Cabinet Minister nearly three years later in November of 2022. The dates don't match. The numbers don't add up. What measures, if any, has the Premier taken to get to the bottom of what happened in Las Vegas? And Mr. Speaker, we'll allow the Integrity Commissioner to do his job, Mr. Speaker. I have every confidence that he can. But when it comes to moving the economy forward, it is this Premier and this caucus which are getting it done, Mr. Speaker. You know who has voted against every single measure to make life more affordable for the people of the province of Ontario? The NDP and the Liberals, Mr. Speaker. You know who is responsible for bringing this province to its knees? The Liberals, supported by the NDP. You know who is responsible for a crisis in this country of affordability because of carbon taxes, because of out-of-control debts, which are causing higher interest rates for all of the people of Canada. It is Liberals supported by NDPs. We see the mistakes over and over order. and over again because what they love is for people to be dependent on government. And what Conservatives want is for people to have the tools to succeed. Response. And what this Premier is ensuring is that people have those tools and 700,000 people show and have the dignity of a job. The final supplementary. What happened in Vegas? Speaker Rematula, Rematula didn't just benefit Order. from the Greenbelt scandal. A report from the Auditor General listed him as the top beneficiary of multiple MZOs. In fact, on the same day that the Greenbelt grab was announced, this government was also serving up changes to the land use plans in York Region to benefit him. The Integrity Commissioner concluded that the evidence suggests that someone must have tipped him off. Was it the former cabinet minister? Was it the premier's principal secretary? Was it his director of housing policy? They were all in Vegas at the same time. Back to the premier. Why? <laughs> Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Again, we'll allow the Integrity Commissioner to do his job, but what is shocking to me is that we're five years into our mandate, a mandate of growth and prosperity for the Order. people of the province of Ontario, and somehow now the Leader of the Opposition has just figured out that we're in a housing crisis. Somehow she's just figured out that we're trying to do something about Order. it. We have brought forward four housing supply action plans to do what? Build more homes for the people of the province of Ontario. And you know who's voted against order. every single one of them? They have. Welcome to the party. We're trying to build more homes for the people of the province of Ontario. We're doing it across York Region. We're going to do it in Toronto. We're going to do it in Peel Region, despite the fact that the Liberals have a potential leadership candidate who votes against building more homes, Mr. Speaker. You know why? Because that is the legacy of Liberals and NDP. Obstacles, obstacles, obstacles. Thoughts? We're removing those obstacles. Obstacles. We will get it done. We will build 1.5 million homes. We will not be distracted, despite the musings of the leader of the opposition. Support it. Thank you. The next question. 
Order. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is also to the Premier. After months of public pressure, this government has finally tabled legislation to reverse its own disastrous green, be green belt grab. The Auditor General concluded that this government had gave preferential treatment to a select few land speculators in their green belt decision. In fact, the government minister was found to have breached ethics law, while another minister was partying in Vegas with a favored land speculator. In total, we have seen the departure of three ministers and three senior conservative staffers, and now a criminal investigation by the RCMP. So to the Premier, what actions will the Premier personally take if criminal charges are laid in his Greenbelt scandal? Thank you, Speaker. And to respond, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Mr. Speaker, as we have said all along, we made a public policy decision that was not supported by the people of the province of Ontario. For that, we are sorry. But the intention of that policy was to build more homes for the people of the province of Ontario. Now, we have moved quickly to reverse that decision. The Premier made the decision to restore those Greenbelt lands. But let there be no doubt, if there is any doubt in the minds of the opposition, if they think that we are going to be distracted from building 1.5 million homes for the people of the province of Ontario in every corner of the province, they should think again, Mr. Speaker, and that includes in the riding of the member for Scarborough yes. Southwest. It includes that in the member for Toronto Danforth. It includes Northern Ontario, who have asked me, help us build more homes in Northern Ontario to support the mining and the incredible economic development that is going on there. It includes Southwestern Fox. Ontario that are seeing more long-term care homes and more economic activity, battery plants, auto manufacturing. They want more homes to support that economy. So despite the fact that they're against it, we'll continue to get the job. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, their apologies are too little too late and only came after months of outcry and protest to this government's decision. The Auditor General said that she can't even call their Greenbelt decision a process, but rather an exercise, an exercise that the Integrity Commissioner said, and I quote, Speaker, rushed, non-transparent, and almost reckless, and marked by unnecessary hastiness and deception." End quote. Speaker, back to the Premier. How can the people of Ontario trust the government's rushed, non-transparent, and almost reckless decision-making process? Okay. <laughs> Members, of please take your seats. Members, take their seats. To reply, the Premier. Th th thank you for the question to the member of Scarborough. I'll tell the member of Scarborough why the people of Scarborough trust us. As we're building a subway for Scarborough that they never had, the member voted against it. When we're building a brand new hospital for Scarborough that they haven't seen in over 50 years, the member voted against it. When we're building a medical school in Scarborough to graduate more doctors to go into the new hospital in Scarborough, the member voted against it. When we're building long-term care for the residents of Scarborough, the member voted against it. But what we voted for, when they were in power, they lost 300,000 jobs along with the Liberals. Today, there's 700,000 more people working today than there was five years ago. And thousands of people in Scarborough are working that never had a job before. We're going to continue making sure we have a strong economy and we're building the 1.5 million homes that the people of Scarborough. Order. Thank you. The next question, start the clock, member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. In recent years, uh, the Southeast Asian region has become increasingly important to the global economy, with rapid economic expansion, massive infrastructure projects, and a growing middle class. There are significant economic opportunities for Ontario in this region. I understand that the minister has just returned from a trade mission in that part of the world. Speaker, can the minister please share how our government is ensuring Ontario is able to capitalize on the massive economic opportunities that are emerging in Southeast Asia? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Last week, we wrapped up another successful trade mission to Singapore, Vietnam, and back to South Korea. 
We met with leading companies in the region who were excited to learn more about the endless opportunities Ontario has to offer. But we also announced the opening of a new trade and investment office in Singapore next year. Our, this will be our province's first office in the ASEAN region. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations is home to 10 countries in Southeast Asia, more than 600 million people, and significant economic opportunities. With our new office, Speaker, we'll have a gateway to some of the world's strongest and most diversified economies so that we can continue to secure more investment that create more good-paying jobs Spons. and add to the 700,000 workers we have already seen here in Ontario. Yeah. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer and his leadership. Uh, it's great to hear that we're opening up a new trade and investment office in Singapore which is the economic heart and innovation hub of Southeast Asia. It's crucial that we make sure uh, companies across this world know that Ontario is there to be open for business and everything to offer. With our highly skilled workforce, uh, low business costs and world-class innovation ecosystem, there is no better place than Ontario for a business to grow. Speaker, our trade and investment offices allow us to let the world know about the wealth of opportunities Ontario has to offer. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the importance of our network of international trade and investment offices? <coughs> Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you, Speaker. Our global trade and investment network plays a key role in attracting job-creating investments and boosting exports of Ontario-made products. We have 14 international trade and investment offices. In the past five years, those offices have attracted nearly $10 billion in new investments into Ontario. They've created 10,000 good-paying jobs in Ontario, and we're making sure that Ontario is top of mind for investors all across the globe. So with our new office in Singapore, we'll now have a gateway to the ASEAN region, along with access to companies looking for a Canadian foothold. We're now making sure that companies in all corners of the globe no, there is Spons. no better place than Ontario to invest and grow. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, this government is shamefully under criminal investigation by the RCMP for the Greenbelt grab and corruption. The information we've received from the Auditor General and the Integrity Commissioner shows that this government gives preferential treatment to developers and wealthy insiders who can afford to cozy up to them. Does the Premier believe that small businesses who can't afford to make big political donations to his Conservative Party deserve the same say in government decisions? To reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. <laughs> Can you imagine a member of the NDP getting up to talk about small business, right? <laughs> Can you imagine that, right? So they want to increase taxes for our small businesses and have voted against every single measure to put more money back in the pockets of our small business people. This is a party that voted with the Liberals to transition our economy away from small business to just a service economy. They gave up on small businesses across the province of Ontario. Contrast that with us, this Premier, this Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation. When we talk about bringing $27 billion worth of investment to Ontario, that is just top line. You know what also happens in St. Thomas, in Markham, in Stouffville? Small businesses thrive. You know why we want to build more homes? Because downtowns in Stouffville, in Newmarket, in Aurora have signs on the door in the small Spons. businesses. Help wanted, Mr. Speaker. That is what is happening across the province of Ontario. We have a for small business who has been knocking it out of the park. Thank you. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. As a former small business owner who I've owned three businesses and I founded one BIA in Toronto, I can tell you that a new democratic government will support and will always support small businesses. Order. Speaker, during the pandemic, over 360 Order. small businesses in Ontario.
The member for Toronto Centre rightfully has the floor. I need to be able to hear her as she asks her question. We start the clock. Member for Toronto Centre. Thank you again, Speaker. During the pandemic, over 360,000 small businesses in Ontario took up the SIBA loan to keep their lights on. Over half of those small businesses now report that they have not returned to pre-COVID revenues. Even more cannot make their payment deadlines. They're calling on every order of government for help, including this government, which has chosen to ignore them. In fact, the Premier has shown more enthusiasm for rewarding big foreign companies like Thermae with a $650 million subsidy at Question. Ontario Place. <clears throat> Speaker, how many more Ontario families have to shut their small businesses before this government will stand up and help? Good question. Members of Kingston, please. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing can reply. Uh, so the, remember that the NDP voted against every single support that we put in place during uh, the pandemic for small businesses. They voted against all of it. But let me let me help the N NDP understand something. In Ottawa, the NDP hold the balance of power meaning they could tell the federal government to change the way they're collecting the SIBA from small businesses. They could literally hold the government accountable and say, either make a change or we will bring you down. So call 1-613 Jagmeet Singh and say, listen, today at 2.30, get up in the House of Commons and say, we will bring you down unless you stop collecting the SEMA from people. It's very easy. You can get it done. Pick up the phone and call Jagmeet. Stop the clock. I think the member for Brantford Grant would like to ask his question. I'm guessing he would ask his colleagues, if he could, to quieten down. The House will come to order. Start the clock. Member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Great, Minister. Ontario colleges have been long recognized as a key economic driver in our province. They help to provide our students with a strong and respected education that contributes greatly to addressing labour market needs. My riding of Brantford Brand is home to several post-secondary institutions, including Conestoga College's very own Brantford campus and very near to my heart, Six Nations Polytech. Speaker, as the labour market continues to evolve, colleges across the province need to be willing and able to ensure that the education they provide keeps pace with ever-changing labour market needs. Ontario's colleges are willing but it is up to our government to ensure that they are able. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting Ontario's colleges to prepare students for the jobs of the future? Thank you. To reply, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that very important question. When it comes to preparing students for rewarding careers and supporting Ontario's economy, our colleges will never settle for second best. And in fact, IBT College, who I introduced earlier, has just returned home after winning the Digital Innovation in Learning Award for their work in creating micro-credentials that utilize augmented reality and virtual reality at the Pioneer Awards in London, UK. So congratulations, team. <laughs> Across the province, our colleges are working with employers to identify current and future labour market needs that will not only result in great careers, but will continue to drive Ontario's economic success. Our presidents, faculty, staff, and of course, our students know that they need to keep Ontario on top, and our government is here to support them every step of the way. When schools needed shorter approval times to offer new programs so students could get the education they deserve, we reduced Spots. the wait time for a new program from three years down to six months. When students wanted more opportunities to further their education at home, we created new and affordable pathways to upskill their education. Thank you. Supplementary question. Member for Brantford Bank. All I can say is wow from the minister's response. It is clear that our government is dedicated to Ontario students and to the college sector as a whole. The reputation of Ontario's colleges as world-class educators and job creators is unquestioned. However, to be the best, we cannot rely on our past achievements and successes. Our colleges must continually set a high standard when it comes to innovation that addresses evolving labour market needs 
in a rapidly changing world. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our, our government is enabling Ontario colleges to position themselves as leaders in the post-secondary education? Thank you. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I agree with the member when he says, wow, and that's what companies across the world are saying about Ontario's post-secondary education when they're looking at coming to Ontario. I'm a strong believer in what the member has said. To the best, you need to set the standard. Programs like Learn and Stay, micro-credentials, and three-year college degrees are all examples of what our government is doing, taking leadership in new and exciting areas in post-secondary education that are being replicated across Canada and the world. We have made investments in the research being done on our campuses that are leading to constant innovations and new ways of thinking that are shaping the future of education and work. And the world is taking notice. That's why global businesses are, living up to the, are lining up and setting up shop in Ontario, because they know the education and skill set of our graduates is second to none. Speaker, if the members of this House still aren't convinced, I suggest they join me tomorrow at Response. the Ontario College Fair where they can see firsthand how Ontario colleges are ready to continue to prepare students for the jobs of the future. The next question, the member for Spadina, Fort Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier, the Premier refuses to disclose the terms of the government's 95-year lease with Therma, but we know the agreement forces Ontario taxpayers to pay at least $650 million for a new parking garage and site preparation. And this is a 95-year deal with an Austrian company that was facing bankruptcy just three years ago. Normally, Infrastructure Ontario discloses who is putting up the financing for its projects, but not in this case. So my question to the Premier is, what is the source of Thermos financing for its Ontario Place development? Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Mr. Speaker, what we are trying to achieve here is have good tenants on the site that will have activities for families to do all year round, and Therme does that. And what we are also trying to achieve on the site is build parking so that we can make it as accessible for families across Ontario to visit the site that belongs to the people of Ontario. That's 15 million people. Mr. Speaker, Speaker, we will continue to make Order. progress on the site and bring it back to life so that it, it will once again be enjoyed by families here, here. all the time. It is not today. Supplementary question. The member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. Therma has made promises all over the world, pledging to spend billions on new luxury spas. Therma promised to invest $350 million in Ontario. However, it is Ontario taxpayers who will be paying over $650 million for a new parking garage, new water infrastructure and other site preparation work for public land that Therma will control for 95 years. Order. Therma was on the brink of bankruptcy only three years ago. We don't know if Therma actually has the money. 95 years is a long time for a company that barely made it through the decade. Yeah. So can the Premier prove to the public that any due diligence was done to confirm the source of Therma's financing? Order. Minister of Infrastructure. Here yesterday, when we clearly articulated in the House that Therma was not only uh, the winning proponent with our government through Infrastructure Ontario in 2019, but also a leading contender uh, through the procurement led by the Liberals Order. before we were even in office. So clearly, through two different evaluation criteria, they were still a top contender. Mr. Speaker, Ontario Place has fallen into disrepair. Everyone knows it. Everyone that goes there, everyone that drives Order. by knows that the island is in need of love Order. and care. And now we will have a wonderful tenant that will have activities for families that will also be contributing to annual maintenance of this site so that it can be enjoyed for years and years to come. Order. Order. The next question, the member for Beaches East York. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. I have sat in this legislature for over a year now and have yet to hear the government speak point blank to the people of Ontario about the climate emergency we are in. Instead, they are embroiled in the colossal 
Greenbelt land swap scandal now being investigated by the RCMP for criminal behaviour. And the government's pitiful track record on climate action speaks for itself. Attempting to sabotage the Greenbelt, hiding the climate change impact assessment report, cancelling 800 renewable energy contracts, expanding gas plants, clear-cutting Ontario Place, and more. They are woefully behind Order. the rest of the world in environmental leadership. My question, Mr. Speaker, will the Premier please explain why Ontario has yet to declare a climate emergency? To respond, the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Let me, let me tell you, Speaker, under leadership of this Premier and this government, we're responsible for 86 per cent of Canada's total emission reductions, all while working with industry, Speaker. We can both balance the economy and the environment. We can work with industry instead of working against industry. Instead of taxing poor consumers and raising the price of groceries and the cost of the pumps with the very expensive carbon tax that rises, raises the price on everything, I ask the member opposite, talk to your Liberal counterparts, counterparts, please plead with them that Canadians cannot afford a carbon tax, but yes, we can fight the environment, we can, we can treat climate change seriously, we can work with industry, but we'll not pass the, uh, the cost down to the consumer. And Speaker, if that's not just enough, I'll tell you how we're working with industry partners and not against them, such as our government's investment in green steel, in AM DeFasco in Hamilton, for example. This will see the equivalent emissions of one million cars taken off the road. And that's just not it, Speaker. Our transit Fox. strategy as well is taking billions of cars off the road. The supplementary question. Toronto, Burlington, Prince Edward County, Halton Hill, Sarnia, Oakville, Belleville, Kenora, Vaughan, Brampton, Mississauga, Collingwood, Barry, Cornwall, Newmarket, Huntsville. A total of 65 municipalities in Ontario have already declared a climate emergency. Communities you all represent, our cities and towns know it to be true and are actually implementing strong climate adaptation and mitigation measures, while this government fails to lead. We need to wake up to the floods, extreme heat, forest fires, and start getting serious about protecting and preparing Order. Ontarians for the future. Anything less is a dereliction of duty and pure negligence. My question, Mr. Speaker, yes or no, does the Premier believe question. we are in a climate emergency, and when will he declare one for Ontario? Yeah. <clears throat> Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Sure. Well, you know, our government believes in actions speak louder than words. When her government had an opportunity, she talked about Barry. Well, let, let me tell you about my community of Barry. When the Liberals had an opportunity to help clean up the Lake Simcoe, they cancelled the fund to clean up Lake Simcoe. Instead of this government is funding to help keep that lake clean. Uh, when the, that government had a chance to both uh, reduce the cost uh, of living for uh, many Canadians who need it now, while still treating climate change as uh, a serious uh, impact on the environment, that government did nothing about it. Instead, this government is acting with industry, reducing our greenhouse emissions. And, Speaker, we set a historic record. We were the first uh, province in all of Canada that actually put out the climate impact assessment, the very impact assessment that that member spoke about in her question. Yep. We are the leaders in this, and we expect, uh, based on the outcomes of that report, we have a lot of plans to work with industry, not against them, to create jobs, to create economic opportunity, here, here. all while protecting the environment. Here, here. Order. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Oh, great Minister. My community of Burlington is located between Toronto and Niagara Falls on the shores of Lake Ontario. Many local businesses in my riding are eager to benefit from visitors enjoying our hospitality while their businesses continue, contribute greatly to the local economy. While we see that the tourism industry is improving, impacts of ongoing global economic uncertainty continue to present challenges. That's why our government must remain committed to ensuring tourism remains a priority for ongoing support, ensuring communities like mine continue to thrive. 
Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to encourage and promote tourism across Ontario? That's a good question. The minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, speaker, you bet I can. Um, and, and I'd like to thank you for your support in community, uh, in the Burlington community and the industry, including tourism, that is driven partially by what you do in Burlington. So thank you. Uh, wh when we talk about throwing and uh, uh, thriving and growing in history, uh, tourism really touches all of us, all of us in this legislature. And it's because of the people across Ontario, those that are in tourism, those that are in the businesses of tourism, and those are, that are driving results. That comes from leadership, Mr. Speaker. Leadership comes from taking a, a situation like the pandemic, stepping back, realizing what you can do and do well, get better at it, and then when everything op opens up and the sun shines, you get better and better and better. And that's what's going on in tourism, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Ontario is the most visited destination in Canada. And I can tell you, just coming back from uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, Response. in our federal provincial territorial meeting, a shout out to Minister Crocker, who did a great job hosting. We are in great shape. Things are improving, and more people are starting to come in. And I'll fill you in a little bit more. In a Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The tourism industry in Burlington appreciates our government's continued support for the vital work they do in our economy. Our restaurants, hotels, and attractions are looking forward to increased attendance and revenues throughout the entire year. The growth we've seen in Ontario's tourism sector is encouraging, and just recently, we all had the privilege of meeting with representatives from the Tourism Industry Association regarding the good work they're doing for this sector. The tourism sector contributes significantly to Ontario's economy and benefits many other industries as well. The importance of tourism cannot be understated. It's vital that our government continues to address challenges that many tourism-related businesses face. That's right. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the long-term outlook for tourism in Ontario? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you for the, thank you for the question. Let, make no mistake about it, tourism is a huge economic driver. Uh, we're investing $40 million in the sector. And we're not picking and choosing, we're going across the board, Mr. Speaker, because the hard work of everyone involved in tourism in this province is showing in great strides. It's never been better. Yeah, it's still a little bit tough at times, but again, back to the leadership and the smart people that are in this industry are driving things forward, Mr. Speaker. A great example, Monday night I was invited to Ripley's Aquarium for their 10th birthday wow. or anniversary. Happy Got a chance to meet the leadership group and look around to see the people who arrived. It's hard to believe in 10 years, Mr. Speaker, 17 million people wow. have gone through that aquarium. 17 million people have paid to go through that aquarium. And then you think about what are the reasons why? Well, it's a fantastic facility. Awesome. If people in this legislature haven't gone in, go in and buy a ticket. But the other That's part of it is, Mr. Speaker, it's where they are. When you bring things together, like the Rogers Centre and CN Tower and restaurants, when you bundle things, people come and they stay longer, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, I asked the Committee on Government Agencies to call Metrolink CEO Phil Verster to answer questions about the failing Eglinton Crosstown LRT. Unfortunately, Speaker, the government members voted against that motion. The Eglinton Crosstown LRT is a billion dollars over budget and three years late. It has at least 260 deficiencies right down to the rails. Taxpayers have spent over $500 million as the partners building this project have been suing each other under Mr. Verster's watch. But we found out this morning, through disclosure, that his contract has been renewed for three years. Why? Shame. To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, we have launched the largest transit expansion plan in the history of this province. Historical and, uh, historical and unprecedented, absolutely. $70 billion over the next 10 years. Wow. World class transit systems across this entire province. Let's look at the city of Toronto. We're building the Scarborough Line, where we actually have shovels already in the ground, Mr. Speaker. The Ontario Line, just visiting that with the uh, Premier uh, a week ago and the Minister of Infrastructure. We've got shovels in the ground on these historic projects. And what are the facts here are that the members opposite, the, both the opposition and the Liberal 
have voted against each of those investments. They voted against getting shovels in the ground on the Ontario line, uh, the Scarborough subway extension, $70 billion of transit expansion investment Spons. that we have done. The members opposite have voted against. We will continue to build transit across this province. Supplementary question. Speaker, what, what, what a shame. Ba back to the Premier. Let's be very clear, despite what my friend just said, the only thing expanding in transit in the province of Ontario right now are the pay packets of management jobs at Metrolinx. Yeah. Mr. Verster is surrounded by an army of 59, 59 vice presidents and 19 C-suite executives, 78 people on the sunshine list for failing us. Wasn't this the government speaker that said the party with the taxpayers' dollars is over? If that's the case, if they believe that, then why are they rewarding Metrolinx executives who are failing the province of Ontario? Why can't we ask them questions at the committee? And why, for heaven's sake, are they putting up ministers to defend a failing executive? Why is Mr. Verser still employed by the province of Ontario? Great question. Members will please take their seats. Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about our investments in transit and what we're doing. The Ontario Line, Scarborough Subway Extension, the Young North Subway Extension. We have members here today uh, from York Region as well. The Eglinton Crosstown LRT, the Eglinton West LRT, the Finch West LRT, the Hazel Mulcallion LRT, the Hamilton LRT, Highway 413, Radford Bypass, over $27 billion in highway transit, uh, sorry, highway investments. Mr. Speaker, this is historical for North America. No one is investing under the leadership of Premier Ford. We're getting this province moving and we're building world-class transit, and we will take no lessons from the NDP on how to build transit. Thank you. Okay, the next question. The member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Oh. I hear from people in my riding that they are concerned about media reports of everyday Ontarians becoming victims of predatory business practices. People are afraid of scams that involve notices of security interests, or NOCEs for short, that can end up costing thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars. Speaker, this type of fraud and exploitation is unacceptable, where vulnerable people are often targeted. No one who is renting or financing something as essential as a water heater or furnace should have to be afraid of predatory providers looking to charge exorbitant fees. Exactly. Mr. Speaker, through you, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to protect consumers and citizens? Good Thank question. you. For consumer and business services. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Carleton for that excellent question and her superb work on behalf of her constituents. Mr. Speaker, every Ontarian deserves to feel safe when purchasing something as essential as a water heater, and our government will not stand by and let bad actors leverage tools like nosies in bad faith to empty hard-working Ontarians' pockets. That is exactly why our government has begun the necessary work to restore confidence to consumers by launching a vital round of consultations that will inform our ongoing work to put an end to the harmful misuse of notices of security interest, otherwise known as nosies. Let me be unequivocally, let me be unequivocally clear, Mr. Speaker, very clear, crystal clear. This government and this premier will not stand idly by. We will not stand idly by and let our most vulnerable consumers be taken advantage of by Response. bad business practices. We are taking decisive action to protect consumers, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and through you, thank you to the minister for his crystal clear response. I'm very pleased to see that the minister has started consultations to address this important issue and the negative effects it has on so many Ontarians. That being said, the most important voices that our government should listen to on this subject are the people of Ontario themselves. Right. Speaker, through you, the people of Ontario expect that their government will protect them from fraudulent schemes. They deserve our respect and protection from harmful and illegal business practices. That's why it is vital that those most impacted by this predatory misuse must be included in the consultations. 
Can the minister please elaborate on how our government is conducting consultations and what actions will follow to protect consumers? Thank you. Public and business service delivery. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you again. And the member is absolutely right. The most important stakeholder we have are the people of this great province. And we need to be speaking. We need to be speaking directly with them and to listen to them to build a solution that protects them from bad actors using nosies to drain their pockets. But I want to take this opportunity and also thank our member from Markham Unionville for bringing forward his motion to investigate this issue more deeply because of consumer concerns. And as well as a member, the great member from Kitchener-Conestoga, for his work with Waterloo Regional Police Services to raise awareness of this widespread fraud. Speaker, this is why my ministry is consulting with consumers, businesses and experts alike to determine the best solution possible, and this Spons. is only the first of many steps to come for our fellow citizens. Thank you. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, through you, Speaker, there have been a record number of wildfires in the province this year, 738, and none have been more affected than the forest rangers who put their lives and health on the line for us by fighting these fires. They need to be reclassified so they will be recognized, compensated, and receive the same WSIB protections as all other firefighters. Will the minister commit to the reclassification of these wildfire workers today? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you uh, very much, Speaker, for the question. And again, it's an opportunity to thank our firefighters who have done an outstanding job during the 2023 fire season. And Mr. Speaker, uh, when I was in Timmins last week, we announced $20.5 million to further expand our ability to fight wildfires in this province. And as part of that was a recognition, again, of the fantastic job that our firefighters do, recognizing that we need more strategies around recruitment and retention for firefighters, recognizing that they require mental health supports because it is a tough and demanding job. And Mr. Speaker, my door has been opened to the firefighters. We have met. We have discussed their concerns. We have talked about how we can make things even better in Ontario, how we can take this great force and work together to protect Ontario, Spons. protect communities, and protect the infrastructure in our communities. Those conversations will always continue, Mr. Speaker, because I have the utmost amount of respect for wildland firefighters in Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary question, a member for Mr. Bouak, James Bay. Thank you, Speaker. They want to be reclassification. The reclassification to the minister. The closed-door press conference the minister held last week excluded frontline forest fire workers. Yep. These workers called out the minister for his statement that he was unable to reclassify their position. The ability to retain and, in fact, encourage new hires in forest fire fighting is essential to meet the challenges of climate change, minister. You can reclassify and deliver fair working conditions to these firefighters with a stroke of a pen. Mm -hmm. Will you do the right thing and commit to reclassification now? The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, uh, my respect for our firefighters in Ontario uh, is unlimited, and the ability to continue to have conversations about the circumstances on which they work under, again, open-door policy, and, and able to have conversations at any time. And that's why, at the meeting we had in July, I took letters from all of the representatives from the union, read those letters personally, had conversations face-to-face -face with our firefighters. And, Mr. Speaker, you know, we recognize that it is uh, a challenging position, and, and that's why we, through supporting our forest, forest firefighters, uh, my ministry, alongside the Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development, has asked WSIB to assess who should be covered under the firefighters' regulation, including wildland firefighters. Mr. Speaker, we strive to make working conditions better for our firefighters in Ontario. The they are doing a great job Response. for us, and we'll continue to work with them and make sure that that job is something that they're always proud of, because we sure are proud of them. The next question, the member for Brantford Grant. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Housing. For too many Ontarians, finding an affordable home they can call their own seems out of reach. At the same time, many municipalities struggle to attract new jobs and businesses due to various challenges. Our government recognizes the critical importance of both increasing housing supply and spurring economic development in communities across our province. This legislature recently debated Bill 134, which, if passed, will help more Ontario families realize the dream of home ownership while also empowering municipalities to boost local employment opportunities. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to make housing more affordable and to better support our municipalities in attracting new jobs and industries to their regions? Thank you. The Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you once again to the great member of Brantford Brent for yet another fantastic question thrown my way. We knew that through the More Homes Build Faster Act, we would be opening, opening up opportunities to build more affordable homes. And, but we also knew that high development charges in some communities over $100,000 per house was making the price of affordable housing, in fact, all housing, uh, out of reach for many Ontarians. Speaker, we had to eliminate these development charges from affordable housing. We listened and we acted. So what did we do? We opened up new possibilities for seniors, um, for students, for newcomers of this country and this province, and for first-time homebuyers. And what are the results we're seeing? More purpose-built rentals, more multi-generational homes, and starter homes for first-time homebuyers. Every Ontarian deserves a roof over their head. Bonds. Our pathway is bringing keys to thousands of Ontarians that deserve housing stability and a chance to own their own home. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I agree with the Minister that individuals and families across Ontario should be able to access housing of all types. As we work towards building more housing, a thriving supply chain is crucial for both urban and rural communities across our province. Municipalities will play a key role in strengthening our supply chain networks at the local level. However, not all municipalities have the same capacity and resources, which can create challenges when applying for provincial programs and incentives. It is vital that our government recognizes the importance of munici municipalities as equal partners. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our government is supporting municipalities to benefit from provincial supply chain programs and provincial supply chain strategies. Thank you. Associate Minister of Housing to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Brantford Brant. Uh, led by Supply Ontario, our government is empowering municipalities to explore joint venture opportunities, procurement activities to achieve savings. And as the minister below me here will appreciate cutting red tape cutting costs, streamlining best practices is not only good business, it's common sense, and it's really good governance, and that's what we're all about. A more efficient supply chain will result in better and, better and more housing built in this province. As outlined in the Bill 134, um, we're proposing changes as well to help smaller communities uh, around the historic St. Thomas investment uh, with Volkswagen. By the way, Speaker, I just learned today it's the fourth largest manufacturing site in the world. It will be when completed, and uh, we're excited about that. And what does that mean? It means economic prosperity Spons. to the important <coughs> parts of this province, 3,000 new jobs, 30,000 tertiary jobs. This government has a mandate to act. We're not going to create economic uh, prosperity. We're going to build homes to match up these jobs. Thank you. The next question, the member for Nickelback. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Health Minister from across the country met in Prince Edward Island. I, like many Ontarians, I'm quite anxious to find out what kind of progress was made for people suffering from rare disease. Can the Minister share with us? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the, um, the Charlottetown meeting for the Health ministers 
federally, provincially, and territorially uh, was interesting. Last week, we covered a lot of topics. Um, most pointedly, one of the issues that we pressed aggressively to our federal counterparts was to make sure that one of the changes that is being recommended, that is changing the um, two-year current family health uh, doctors to a three-year training, be reverted and not move forward. Why? Because every single provincial health minister understands that it is important today, right now, to make sure that we have as many health ministers, as many uh, doctors going into the system as possible, and now is not the time to move from a two-year residency to a three-year. We had unanimity on that particular topic, Response. as well as many others that I'm happy to cover in my supplementary question. The supplementary question. Speaker, members from Ontario Life Science Sectors are at Queen's Park today. We all know that the federal government has budgeted $500 million for rare disease treatments. Can the minister tell us about Ontario rare disease strategy and how much of the $500 million federal money will be coming to help Ontarians gain access to life-saving rare disease treatments? Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. So as part of the discussion, absolutely, we talked about rare diseases, but as the member talked about Ontario specifically, I'm proud to say that Ontario leads the country. As new um, pharmaceuticals come online, Ontario has led Canada in making sure that they are on our drug formulary and they are provided through OHIP to our citizens. You know, I point to Trifecta, which was one of the first ones Ontario led the, uh, the Canadian jurisdictions, a new drug that treated uh, children with cystic fibrosis. Uh, we, with RSV, have now a vaccine that is Health Canada approved and is available to our most vulnerable in Ontario the first and only province in Canada that is doing this for uh, long-term care and high-risk individuals in retirement homes. Why? Because we see in Ontario a need to Response. make sure that we protect our most vulnerable, and we act very quickly to make sure that as these drugs come online and get approved throughout Canada, they are available to Ontario citizens. Thank well, you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Chatham-Kent-Leamington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to Associate Minister of Housing. Speaker, housing affordability has become a pressing impact across Ontario's communities. Home ownership has become out of reach for many young families and newcomers in my riding of Chatham Kent Leamington. A significant number of renters are also facing unaffordable housing costs that limit their ability to purchase other life necessities. Despite our government's robust measures to accelerate housing supply, Ontario needs more homes built now. Our government must continue to build on our effort to do all we can to address the housing supply shortage. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please share with the House how our government is providing housing solutions for all Ontarians? Great question. Great question. The Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Chatham Kent Leamington. My neighbour down in southwestern Ontario was doing a great job. You know, as Ontario, as Ontario uh, fights this housing crisis, we remain committed to ensuring that all Ontarians have a safe place to call home. And every month, I'm encouraged to see that we're seeing housing projects underway in communities across this whole province. And why, Speaker? Because we've introduced four housing supply action plans. Why, Speaker? Because we've invested $1.2 billion in the, in the Building Faster Fund, and we've invested $700 million in the Homelessness Prevention Plan, up 42 percent, or $200 million, Speaker. The plan is working. We've got shovels in the ground. We're going to get keys in people's hands. We're on a pathway to success. The job's getting done. That concludes our question period for this morning. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m.